It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Thomas Cooper of Thomas M. Cooper and Associates. He's a specialist in dental transitions, planning, and practice coaching. He is fee-based and not a broker. Tom has been coaching dentists exclusively for over 18 years. The goal at Thomas M. Cooper and Associates is to help doctors increase the wealth in their practice. This doesn't mean just increasing the monetary value of the practice, but increasing the life freedom of the doctor and the team. Tom co-developed the Mercer Transitions Company, making it the premier transitions planning company. After Mercer Transitions Company was acquired by a private equity firm, Tom formed Thomas M. Cooper and Associates and continued to work with private clients. Tom earned his BA at the University of Southern California, Phi Beta Kappa, and his law degree from Loyola Law School. He also learned his earned his chartered life underwriter and chartered financial consult degrees from the American College. Man, you have had an outstanding career. I've been watching it. I'm in Phoenix and you're in Scott, so I've been watching it for 20 years. Amazing. How are you doing today? Well, I'm doing great. Thank you for seeing those things. It's very nice. So what would you say if someone just asked you, like, what, what's the state of the dental industry today, especially compared to how it was when I got out of school in 1987, 30 years ago? Is it, what, what is the state of the industry today, would you say? Uh, I would say that the industry is probably stronger than ever. No. Um, it, yeah, I, I think that uh, while we went through, as most industries did, uh, particularly in the Southwest, but all over the country, my, my, my uh, practice is national. Um, you know, we went through the, you know, uh, 08, 09, uh, 10, 11 recession. Um, and saw some uh, some shrinkage uh, and uh, uh, retraction in in the in the business. I'd say that dentistry, particularly private dentistry, has never been stronger. Wow, um, a lot of people are afraid of corporate dentistry. They think that's going to be a game changer. They think we're all going to be working at Walgreens. Even even a lot of the the corporate people think they're going to get half the market in the next twenty years. Do you see their growth being as robust and linear as they think it is? Uh, no, I don't actually. I, uh, I disagree with that sentiment. Um, I, I, I view, I, 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 I mean, corporate dentistry is here to stay. There's a place for that. There's a demographic for it. Um, for private dentistry, which is what we work with for private practitioners, I think corporate dentistry has been a godsend. Um, if you ask me, Howard, uh, say, uh, 10 years ago, um, you know, uh, the number one question I got from clients was, how do I find associates? There aren't enough people graduating from dental school. They're all going to medical school, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the fact is that uh, due to a lot of things that have happened politically over the last 10 years, uh, there are fewer people going to medical school. Uh, more, more young people with a good science and math background are going to dental school than ever. Um, dental schools are opening. Um, there are more people interested in dentistry. And I view corporate dentistry really as kind of the farm system, if I can use a baseball analogy, for dentistry. Um, we're seeing a lot of great associate candidates who go spend a couple, three years right out of school in corporate. They make a nice salary, make a nice living. They learn their chops. And then they want to go do what they got in dentistry for, and that is be a private practitioner. So they come out of that farm system much more ready than they did before. It seems like the business model in dentistry, the only one that's stable is still an individual owning their own practice. It seems like in private practice and in corporate practice, associates are just a revolving door. You just very rarely see places that have kept associates, you know, 8, 10, 12 years routinely. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Well, I agree with it because that is the because the vast majority and not to, you know, pat myself on the back, but the vast majority of transitions are done improperly. And so you naturally get turnover because they didn't do the process right. I'm, I'm very proud to say that in our uh, practice, uh, the vast majority, I mean, like in the range of the 90 percentile. Um, uh, of deals that we complete, um, they stay forever. They stay partners. Um, now, of course, you've got situations where you come in as a trial candidate to see if it's going to work. It doesn't work. You want to move. Your family's not happy. Whatever reason, the associate moves on. But in deals that are going to go forward with us, they stay. 
they stay married, as I like to say, use that marriage analogy. They stay married. They don't get divorced. There is turnover, a tremendous amount of turnover, Howard, but that's because the deals aren't done properly. They're done in a hurry, and they don't do the right groundwork. I, I guess maybe I said that wrong. Um, a, an associate to transition, that's that what I'm talking about. I, I was talking about the business model where one person's always going to be the owner, and he's going to have several locations just filled with employees that will be employee associates forever. I just don't see that business model um, having, uh, I just see that business model having huge turnover of their associate dentist. Well, you're absolutely, they, they do. Those, that, that model does have huge turnover and it's almost like a mini corporate model. Um, so, you know, you're going to lose associates in that situation. And, and in, in many cases, when, when we see that happening, um, you're putting associates in the satellite. If that owner doctor isn't spending time in that satellite, um, you're basically building goodwill for that associate. Uh, so, you know, it, there, you're, the, the, if that's not, if, if group, if, if practices like that with multiple offices aren't handled properly, if it's not designed properly, you're going to have tremendous turnover. So if my homies go to your website, which is Thomas Cooper and Associates, what do they find and what, what, are, what are you doing for them? Uh, yes, it's Thomas M. Cooper and in the A-N-D, not the Amperson, but the A-N-D uh, associates dot com. Um, well, they'll find out uh, it's not an uh, overly elaborate website. It's basically designed to just provide some testimonials to tell you what we do. Uh, we have a library on there to show. I, I have a monthly newsletter that I send out to my clients. Um, and my, my, uh, uh, business, uh, relationships, um, and th those letters, those articles are on there and it basically tells you, tells a client or a prospective client what it is that we do and really tr distinguishes us from brokers because the, the vast majority of deals, unfortunately for, for, for clients are still done by brokers. Well, you know, uh, you're talking to a lot of kids that's flying over their head, you know, 30 years ago. One of the big pioneers was AFCO, and he was taught, um, Alan F. Thornburg was talking about how the fastest way to get the deal done is have the lawyer, one guy, represent both sides at the same time. Then other people come along and said, wow, no one, who's representing you if he's representing the other guy? And then you're um, saying that you're a purely fee-based as opposed to a broker. I think you're talking to a lot of kids who don't know exactly what that means. Well, um, it, it's it's a great question. Um, the, the what we do is uh, we represent what I call represent the deal. Uh, we're looking to uh, work with in most cases, not all cases. I still have maybe ten percent of my cases where I might do just buyer representation or seller representation. Let's say uh, a broker comes in. I'll come back to that. But a broker is representing the seller as they always do. And the buyer says, gee, Tom, I want somebody to look out for me. Would you do that on a buyer representation set? We'll do that. But that's 5% of my cases. The vast majority of our cases, we're looking after both sides um, and representing the deal. And the idea being that if we really design the deal, whether it's valuation or financial analysis or the legal documentation or you name it, the whole business design, if we're looking at it from the point of view of making this marriage last a lifetime, we're going to do it right. Now, the problem with even though legal background and all that stuff, my background's in tax and corporate and all that stuff, but we, we don't exclude the lawyers. We actually invite the lawyers and CPAs to be involved. But after we've designed the deal and made it fair for both sides, we don't want buyer's lawyer to come in, fight seller's lawyer. They go to war. You spend $100,000 and the deal ends up dying. Now, brokerage is an entirely different business model. Um, it's, I don't begrudge anyone's way of making money, but it's for, for doing what we do, design properly design transitions and business partnerships, it's the worst thing um, because the broker is paid on commission, typically around 10%, anywhere from 8 to 10% of practice value. They also do the practice value. So you've got the guy who's going to get paid a percentage of the practice value doing the practice valuation. So right out of the box, there's a conflict of interest. And they were, even though they represent themselves as representing both sides, it's just not true. So 
coming in, buying doctor knows that and is immediately suspicious. So immediately you're on the wrong foot. You've got people suspicious. You've got the wrong context. And, and they're doing it. They're valuing it for the seller. They're paid by the seller based upon value, just not the way we do things. Everybody's saying it's a seller's market because all the old guys like me selling were from a class size of about 4,000 graduates. And now the class size is 6,000. So if you have 6,000 kids wanting to buy a practice from 4,000 old timers, it's got to be a seller's market. Do you agree with that? Uh, well, not, not entirely, Howard. I mean, you remember, you do have the corporate dentistry model. So you've got kids can go to that world and, and, uh, they, you know, they can all, you know, they, they, uh, they can be kind of worker bees and work in associate mills, like you were describing earlier, practices that aren't interested in making you an owner and so on. But for practices that are really inter seriously interested in properly designed transition planning, and I can come back to what that means. It's not selling your practice. It's a, it's a wealth building strategy. That's what transitions is about. Not brokerage, not just selling your practice, but building wealth. And for practices that are interested in building freedom and wealth for the owner, this is the only way to go. And so in that respect, there it's not just a seller's market. The buyer, you know, they're looking for, for folks, for young people or for older folks to come in and partner with them to help build that practice and they need to find the right person. So I would say it's, it's still a very good market for the buyer. And is there a, um, so you're, you're more wealth building of having the associate buy into the practice and be a partner. Yes. So when I say wealth building strategies, what transitions is all about, I'm not saying that eventually, yes, the doctor, older doctor is going to sell out his interest or her interest eventually yeah but we may sell if you want a piece of this practice three four times in, an, in a career um, and what we're doing is we're building the we're building the, this practice we're building the wealth in this practice and over a period of time by bringing in strategically bringing in the right partner so think of it this way I, I am a sole practitioner I own a pie and this is my pie this size and I own the whole pie. I take all the profits. If I am going to bring in an associate to partnership, what we're going to do, I'm going to sell a piece of that pie. But in the process, we're going to grow this practice into a two doctor practice. Now my pie is like this. Now I only own half the pie, but it's roughly the size of the original smaller pie. So we're growing that pie. Now we may bring in a third associate to partnership, you know, fourth and so on. And eventually maybe take out older doctor and there, we create a legacy of growth in this practice and it's not just about money most of my clients are not about just making more money they make good money sure they want to maintain their money but it's really about freedom if i can take this guy maintain his net and take him from four days to three and from three to two and a half and create freedom for time for his church time for his family time for time off etc I've, I've got a very, very happy client, and that's the wealth building strategy. So who's mostly going to your website? Is it mostly older guys like me wanting to find this uh, future partner, or is it younger people that are working in corporate and want uh, uh, another uh, want upgrade? Um, I don't have very many people that are as old as you, Howard, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, they, they, yeah, I mean, un unfortunately, most of the guys are, you know, upper 50s, 60s, and so on. What I'd love to do is get these guys in their 30s. You know, I mean, I've got some clients I, I write in my monthly article of, gosh, I think it was about probably now eight months ago, I wrote a little bit about a client of mine who uh, started with, well, I've got several, but this one in particular I'm thinking of that I wrote about. Um, who started when he was about 36. We've done three or four transitions, actually four. He is now 58 and or 56. And now uh, working as an associate in his practice, we've done three, brought in three other associates to partnership. The three partners on the practice, he's an associate. He works two and a half days a week. He makes as much money as he did when he was a full partner. And the guy takes off three months a year. 
Okay? Nice. So, I mean, you talk about ideal. Now, not everything can be ideal, and we got him early. And and so the, my, my, the moral of the story is start early. Sure, the 58-year-old guy is starting now who's built a tremendous amount of wealth in his practice. He, we got to get to him if, because what's going to happen is over the next five to ten years, his practice value is going to plummet. Because he is simply not, he's, sat, he's what we call a saturated practice. He is not going to be able to maintain and to grow. So his growth period went from 35 to 55. And, and what we ideally get him at that 35 while well, he's starting to grow and bring in associates at that point. But it certainly, by the time he's hit his mid-50s, he's saturated and his practice is going to start to do what we call a transition by default where it's not by design, it's a transition, meaning it's just going to go away. And by the time he retires, his practice could be worth half of what it was. I, I don't know what you call it, but you, you slow down when you when you get older. I mean, I, I remember, you know, when I was 25, I mean, I, I could do 12-hour days, six days a week without blinking. Now Absolutely. at 55, I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> no, that's, that's that you're exactly at the nail on the head, and that's why I call it transition by default. Whether you're conscious of it or not, you're just going to slow down. Your new patient flow is going to slow down. You're busy. You're booked out of six, seven weeks. People perceive you as busy. They go elsewhere. You don't even know it. Um, you know, and so, you, you know, it, it's gradually your practice is going to decline. And what we're trying to do is capture you before you hit that point and really maintain that growth. Now, you may slow down and be doing just the kind of work you want to do, the comprehensive dentistry you want to do and all that because you've got your other younger partners in there doing all the rest of the dentistry. But the practice is continuing to grow. So what made you go on to earn your chartered life underwriter and chartered financial consultant degrees from the American College? Well, when I before I joined Mercer and and was doing I was doing uh, consulting like I do now, but for not just for dentists, but for MDs, for lawyers and CPAs, I was doing the kind of what we call now transition planning. Uh, I was doing business continuation planning for other professionals, and uh, so I was uh, do, earning those degrees, doing financial planning and financial consulting. Um, when I joined Mercer. Um, before we started the, the transitions company, I ran what we call the advanced services group or ASG. And we handled all of the advanced planning issues, whether it was pension and profit sharing or, uh, asset protection or tax or entity planning, all of the stuff that would hit our financial consultants and be a little bit beyond the ken. Uh, we would get bounced up to the ASG, the advanced services group. And I ran that group. So it, it was in that context that I acquired those other designations. That's amazing. Um, you and MTS were just amazing pioneers. And Glenn Weissel, was that yes. pretty much the three musketeers behind that? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Howard Rochester um, and, uh, you know, was, was a partner then too. And Gene Danger. But they really weren't involved in the transition side. It was really Glenn and MT House and I that, that that ran the transition. I ran the company, but that really were designed in the in the in uh, uh, started the design of the company. Yeah, I really like. There's so many great articles on your website. Thomas M. Cooper, spell out and a n d associates dot com. Um, you really have a lot of good PDFs. You know, you might. Um, you, what you ought to do is start a thread on Dental Town. There's a quarter million people on Dentaltown, and uh, over 50,000 of them, uh, mostly the millennials, downloaded the app on the phone. And so I know who's on there. So the ones on the app are usually millennials, and the ones on the uh, desktop are the older guys. But you should you should post all those PDFs. You should start a thread on financial plan. I mean, you've written some great articles. I, I think it would explode your website, and a lot of this stuff um, needs to be read. I mean, it's just something... They always want to take a course on a better bonding agent or how to do the ultimate root canal. And then they don't know anything about um, transitions. They don't know how on uh, tax planning. But what do you think? Um, what do you think dentists need to think more about as far as taxes? Well, um, you know, the the uh, the law is a enormously dynamic area. And it's one of the reasons that I 
that I enjoy it so much is because it changes so much. Um, and um, that is also the problem is it does change so much um, and you got to stay current with it. But the, the uh, we don't know what's going to happen, whether we're going to get tax legislation this year or not. Um, and most certainly we'll get it in the next couple of years. Um, and we don't know what that's going to look like. But um, what we know is what it is today. And there are a lot of issues that do impact, directly impact doctors, uh, and particularly in the transitions area. And I try to write as, about as many of those as I can, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, the proper treatment of good, the sale of goodwill, which is a very commonly misunderstood uh, uh, part of dentistry, or uh, what kind of entity should I be? Or how, how are the entities treated? What, what's the difference between S Corp and LLC? And why should I be one or the other? Um, and so there are a lot of issues, and I do write about those in my articles. And I definitely will take you up on it. I would love to have a thread of those articles on your... Uh, yeah, there's, your- there's 50 categories, and one is financial stuff. And everybody's allowed to have one thread that's like about themselves or their courses or what they're doing. But uh, you just got so many, um, so many great... Uh, um, articles written. So, so tell my homies, what is a goodwill and how should, what should they set up themselves as an NC? Should they be an S corp or an LLC? Um, goodwill, um, is the, uh, largest, uh, asset that's, uh, in a dental practice. Um, it is not the equipment. It's not the technology. It's not the facility. It is the goodwill. And the goodwill is basically everything that gets people to sit down in the chair and open their mouth. It's your reputation. It's your CV. It's your education. It's all the, uh, you know, um, it's the it, it, continuing education. It's all the programs that you take. Um, it, and so all of the things that make you a great dentist and have a reputation uh, in the community, that's your goodwill. It's basically your patient base. So it's typically uh, when we value practice and we only value practices based upon uh, USPAP, which is the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, which is kind of the, 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 not kind of, is the national guideline for how to do proper valuations, not the way brokers do valuations. That's, I digress. But, um, uh, so goodwill is, a, is the largest component. It's the patient base. And, um, and so how that's handled from a tax perspective, it's in the, it, the Internal Revenue Code characterizes it since 1986 as a section 197 intangible. And that's because it's governed by section 197 of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, It is uh, an asset that when sold is sold as a capital asset. And so you recognize capital gain, which is the currently the 20%, unless you're over a certain income limitation where it can go up, but typically 20% um, as opposed to the highest uh, ordinary income rates up close to up around 39%. Um, so that's very favorable for the seller to, it, it's, it, to recognize or realize capital gain. Um, it's then amortizable, uh, that is depreciable, and you can write it off over a 20-year period of time if you're the buyer. Um, that's a flat, it's not accelerated, it's a flat 20 years, 1 20th every year, uh, and that's under the code. Um, the real, the real uh, dicey thing um, it, about uh, goodwill is that a lot of even CPAs and attorneys who don't specialize in dentistry that they don't realize is that goodwill is not a corporate asset. So if you have a professional corporation, either a C corporation, the old fashioned kind, or an S corporation, which is more common, um, it is not owned by the corporation. And this is commonly misunderstood. It is a personal asset of the doctor. And that's been, that's been decided by many uh, court cases and is pretty much settled law and acquiesced to, not formally, but essentially acquiesced to by the IRS. So that's a major, major uh, issue that some people miss. And uh, we don't run into it as often as we used to. Um, I like to think because we've educated people on it, but we used to run into it quite a bit where the CPA or the lawyer was treating it as a corporate asset. Now it's going to get taxed at more like 50% instead of 20 that's a big cost to the doctor if it's not done properly. Um, your second question was about entities and um, probably more than we could do in the time we have. But basically, um, most 
uh, back when you started practice, um, you would have been uh, uh, poorly advised. Uh, somebody would have been committing malpractice if they didn't have you become a professional corporation. Um, and that's because there were a lot of things you could do in a PC that you couldn't do as a sole proprietor. Um, it limited liability, not against malpractice, but against a slip and fall or more traditional negligence. But it also allowed you to have tax advantages that you wouldn't have as a sole proprietor or as a partnership if you had a partner. Then um, a lot of people started changing into S corporations because it simplified things from a C corporation. Now, over the last 10 years, the area of the law under limited liability companies or LLCs has come along. And so if you were starting a practice today, you would certainly become an LLC in any state that allowed it. Not all states allow dentists to practice in LLCs. California, for one. Um, Arizona certainly does, and most states do. But an LLC, to keep it short, is simply um, like ta- is, has the asset protection of, of a corporation, but the tax of a, of a uh, partnership. So it has all the simplicity and pass through things of an S corp or a partnership, but it has the liability protection of a corporation. So it's about as close to having your cake and eating it as you can get. Um, do you think the student loan debt, um, do you think when these kids are coming out 350 to $450,000 in debt, that that almost means they have to be a practice owner someday that getting a job at an associate mill um, working for a percentage is really not um, the way to repay that large of a debt. Do, do, do you almost think if you if you use other people's money to some number, like say four hundred thousand, at that point you have to be a practice owner? Or well, I, I certainly agree with you on that. Um, I think that the cost of, of of becoming a dentist, not to mention a specialist. Um, is such that, you know, you wouldn't do that to just be a worker bee. Um, uh, now, I, I, that's not to say that there aren't situations where maybe, maybe you're a married couple, uh, and you're both dentists, uh, and one chooses, uh, for family reasons to just be an associate. Um, the other one's going to go down the owner track. Fine. But for the vast majority of people who are going through and spending that kind of money in debt, um, yes, they're going to want to become owners. And that's why I said that the, the marketplace uh, for, for quality associates who want to become owners and the marketplace for uh, current owners to bring in those quality partners, it's just never been better. And uh, how much debt would they have to be in before your legal recommendation would be to flee the country and go live in Brazil <laughs> or uh, Indonesia? And do you have a favorite country they should flee to? Where, where would they be? least likely uh, to have a student loan debtor coming back and get their half million? I wouldn't have them go to either of those countries, uh, Brazil or Indonesia. Um, uh, no, I mean, you know, they, they, uh, uh, I would have to say probably uh, Liechtenstein or Switzerland if you're going to go that way. <laughs> I agree. Those are great countries. And Austria, I love that one too. Um, a, a, a very common question these kids have is when they go get a job, the um, older dentist wants to pay them as an independent contractor. And then they get on dental town, they read these confusing things that a independent contractor is more to do with like say construction where I'm building a house, but I really don't know how to do the electrical. I don't know how to do the plumbing. You bring in your own equipment, your own expertise, but in dentistry, you're coming into your office using your equipment. Uh, you know, everything I'm doing. Um, it, are they independent contractors or are they employees? Well, um, your question is uh, very well informed. Um, the, the, you hit the nail on the head again. Um, what really drives under the tax law, what really drives, and this is laid out pretty good detail in the code and the regulations, what is an independent contractor and what is an employee? Actually, the way the code looks at it, the regulations look at it, is what is an employee? Well, they look at both. What is an employee and what creates independence? The kinds of things that create independence are I bring my own tools. I set my own fees. Um, you know, uh, I make my own hours. Uh, I probably use my own staff. So, for instance, I'm an independent contractor, clearly, vis-a-vis my clients. 
Um, but if you're an associate working in a practice and you're using your uh, the owner's equipment, the owner's staff, the owner's tools, hand pieces, et cetera, clearly you're an employee. So this is another one like the goodwill issue. This is another one that was very, that, that's very commonly, and I still see it, where we're treating associate as an independent contractor. And the re- you might say, well, why would anyone do that if the law is so clear? Well, the attraction, first of all, you've got lawyers and CPAs, again, who are misinformed, who allow their clients to do this. Um, and, uh, and the reason an employer might do it is employer doesn't have to pay the payroll taxes. On, uh, and, and employer doesn't have to include you in his retirement plan if you're an independent contractor. Uh, employee might say, well, I'm going to form my own LLC and now I can do all kinds of stuff because I'm not your employee. Well, they're both wrong. And the IRS views these things as, uh, on payroll audits um, <clears throat> as horrible. And they're extremely painful if you get caught doing it. And uh, there are extreme penalties for it. About 85% of the revenue in this, in this country is earned by payroll taxes. So the IRS sees that as its piggy bank. The IRS takes payroll taxes and it takes mischaracterizing people for payroll purposes very, very seriously. So if you characterize somebody as an independent contractor, you do it um, at your great peril. And the IRS court doesn't have a jury, (laughs) correct? It's just you and the IRS judge, right? No. Well, the tax court. uh, Yes. No, the United States tax court is is a judge court. That's correct. Um, and the IRS has their uh, has uh, their counsel, and uh, you have yours. Um, hopefully, it doesn't get to tax. But court. there's hopefully. no jury, though. No, that's correct. I mean, you can't play the OJ game on a bunch of people who don't understand the tax code. My my dad always said everything is tax deductible until you go to tax court. <laughs> well, that, that's true. But hope, hopefully, you don't get to tax court. Hopefully, you win the audit. And my philosophy is that. Anything, anything that I have my clients do has got to pass the giggle test on audit. And what I mean by the giggle test is if the auditor is looking at what you're doing and he's going like this, <laughs> that's not passing the giggle test. Okay. So you want that, you want that auditor to say, yeah, I can see. Okay. Yeah, I can see. I can. See. So you're an endodontist and you go to this practice twice a month. And you go to these other practices another twice a month and you have 12 clients that you see a month and you take your own files and your own scope and you do set your own fees. Okay, I can see all that. Yeah, you're an independent contractor, right? And he's not laughing. He's seeing that objectively that's, that's defensible. Okay, so there are those rare situations, but the vast majority of cases, we, we want to pass audit, not get to tax court. <laughs> and um, you, you actually um – practice and live in Scottsdale, Arizona, which I believe is the most competitive city uh, in all of Arizona. I can't think of a harder place to get going in Scottsdale, Arizona. Do you see, do you think these dentists coming out with so much debt need to be smarter about demographics? I mean, what would you tell, you got you got two dental schools in your backyard, you got AT Still and Mesa, you got Midwestern and Glendale. What would you do if a bunch of class people said, you know, I want to go down to Scottsdale. I want to go practice right where you do. What would you say to that kid? Well, I, I mean, I agree it's competitive. Uh, and uh, if you mean competitive in terms of dental practices, right? Uh, it's, it certainly is. Um, I don't know about most competitive in the country, but there certainly are some no, areas. No, I said in Arizona, most competitive in Arizona. Oh, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and, um, you know, uh that's true, but that's also an advantage to the right associates. Um, there are some terrific practices, and the reason that's competitive is there are some very, very fine dental practices, um, and they're looking for the quality people. Um, you know, again, uh, not to, you know, uh, gild my own lily here, but what one of the advantages to doing it the right way, doing it our way, is that we are doing the valuation objectively in a fair market valuation under USPAP standards by an ASA, accredited senior appraiser. We're doing the financial analysis. We're doing a very rigorous audit of the numbers. All of this is right up front. So even when our clients are just looking for, a, for an associate, they're going through this what we call phase one work so that when these candidates come to them, they're ready. They've got the arrows in their quiver and they're ready to go because – the best associates 
are going to go for that practice that's best prepared for them and is serious about making them a partner. And so if it's just going to be willy nilly and I'm talking to people all the time and they say, well, when can I be an owner? Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll talk about that, you know, um, or yeah, I've got a broker, you know, boy, you're going to scare away a lot of talent. And if you but if you do it the right way, the way we set things up, then you're going to get the best candidates. And, you know, it's a supply and demand thing. Best practices, best associates. Uh, yeah. If you and remember, I mean, just from watching Judge Wapner, I mean, he always asks for your receipt. So all these people, you know, they, after they've been working for someone for a couple of years, they say, well, yeah, he's going to sell it to me. Well, did you get an asking price? Did you get a date? Is there anything in writing? And there's nothing in writing. There's just a bunch of conversations they've had at lunch over the years. And then they finally give up and throw in the towel and feel like they've wasted several years of their life. But what, how long would you say after you've been dating someone and working as an associate that you should really sit down and start talking to someone like you, a lawyer, who's going to put some words on paper and make each one sign it? Well, the, the, we believe in setting the context from the beginning. So if it literally from the interview stage, so we are we are making it very clear, very transparent to the associate um, that, you know, here's what we intend to do. Now, we're going to do a dating period, as you say, we're going to do this kind of honeymoon period where, you know, you're going to work in the practice just as an associate, as an employee for six months, nine months, whatever it takes, just to see if you're a fit and if we're a fit. You may find out this isn't the practice for you. We may find out you're not the associate cum partner for us. But if assuming that all goes well, we're going to move right into what's called phase two or the design phase. And we're going to show you and we're going to draft up a document called a letter of intent. Speaking of putting something in writing, that's going to describe the purchase price, it's going to describe how we're going to structure the entity. Are we going to be an LLC, an S-Corp? How are we going to design the purchase? Is it going to be a stock sale? Is it going to be an asset sale? How are we going to handle, uh, how are we going to pay each other as partners? How are we going to get paid? What happens if someone's disabled? What happens if someone wants to retire? All of the things that are going to go into this deal are going to be put in that letter of intent. So even before we get to documents like a purchase and sale agreement, we'll have that letter of intent. So we have absolute clarity on how this deal is structured. We're doing all that in right in, in that first year of working in the practice. And that's another reason why I go back to the very beginning when I said that the vast majority, and I can literally count on one hand, the deals that we took to marriage that failed. And out of the hundreds and hundreds of deals we've done, because we do all of this spade work, all of this due diligence at the front end. And by the time that associate is signing documents saying I'm coming in as a partner, they're in. And so you've got that context going forward, right, as a worker bee coming into the practice. On Dentaltown, on the website, there's uh, 50 categories, and one of them is called practice transitions, which is what you do. And it, it's a very, it's a very uh, bright, um, vibrant deal. I, I really hope you start posting all your, uh, everything you've read in that corner. Um, one of the associates is asking today, do you think I'm more valuable if I go do an a, a, a residency first before I start looking at becoming a partner? Or do you think I should just go straight in and become a partner? Well, um, you know, my my attitude on residency is if you want to kind of like going to law school. I mean, if you if you if you want to be in the real estate business, don't spend waste your time doing three years in law school. If you want to be a lawyer, go to law. So, you know, some people do these things just because they want to put off the inevitable and stay in school. <laughs> um, and, and they they love to learn and I love to learn. So I, I get that. Um, but, you know, if you're going to go and spend the money and do the time for residency, make sure it's something you want to do. I want to be an orthodontist. I want to be a prosthodontist. So uh, that's fine. Um, you don't need to you know, do it just to set yourself up for ownership um, and, um, you know, go and do your residency because that's what you want to do. There's going to be time for you to become the owner. Certainly it's going to behoove you. I'm working on a client right now, you know, associates just finishing a prosto residency going to be transitioning into ownership in a general practice. Well, he's going to be a very, very high-end general dentist. 
um, with a prosto uh, background. Um, so uh, that's terrific. Um, it's gonna it's gonna work very well in this practice. Um, but that would be my advice: is go go do residency because you want to learn that stuff. Um, some people would say to you, um, it's easy to find an associate in Scottsdale to do what you're doing. But what if I'm out in the middle of nowhere, Nowhereville? Um, how do I find an associate? Do you recommend headhunters? Do you recommend uh, how, how do you how do you find someone to come in and do this when you're in Parsons, Kansas, as opposed to Scottsdale, Arizona? Uh, well, a uh, g- good question. Actually, um, I- if you're looking for Parsons, Kansas, I have a client there, so let me know. Um, <laughs> um, the the uh, uh, and we work nationally. Um, the the uh, headhunters are fine. Be careful that you're not signing. There are still some um, that are basically brokerage houses um, that will do uh, associate placement for a fee. So the uh, like a headhunter, a, 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 pra- a firm, will, I mean, a, a dental practice will pay a fee, let's say a couple thousand dollars or so, or maybe more for the placement of an associate. But make sure you're not signing a brokerage agreement um, because now you're se- selling your soul. So don't sign a brokerage agreement. Make sure it's just an associate placement fee. That's fine. What I find, interestingly, all of these so-called websites, so-called placement services that find you associates, very rarely does it work. 90% of them don't work. Um, they, they don't stick. They don't last. Um, the, it, when we're doing it the way we do it, again, the phase one work, the valuation done properly, the the uh, purchase feasibility analysis that we do, the audit work that we do on the practice, all that's the letter of intent, phase two, the design work. When we're doing all that stuff, that tends to attract the very best quality associates. When you're ready for an associate and you're getting and, and you're putting the word out to your specialists, to your referring doctors, to your colleagues, when you're doing that, it's amazing, even in smaller markets, how quickly people will find you. And um, Dentaltown um, has free classified ads. There's over 6,000 ads on Dentaltown. Um, it's a very, we, um, we made it just like uh, uh, Monster Jobs, you know, all the, all the big employment sure. deals so you can put up a deal. But it, it's a very good, so uh, uh, that, that's another place to uh, find an uh, associate. So I feel like I'm not smart enough to be asking you any more questions. Is there anything I missed or I should have asked? Uh, no, actually, this felt very thorough. Uh, I mean, you seem very, very well informed on this stuff. So you've done your homework, Howard. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, it's uh, It's been really fun watching you guys. I, I consider uh, Mercer a uh, transitions company. I've been, I've been watching you guys forever. And you guys are just, uh, seriously, you guys are just... Uh, so darn smart. You're so innovative. You've done so much for dentistry. Um, it's such an honor that you uh, came on the show today to talk to my homies. And I hope that you go into the uh, on Dentaltown and post those PDFs that you've written that are on your website, Thomas M. Cooper and Associates.com. So, Thomas, thank you so much for all that you've done for dentistry. And thank you so much for coming on my show. Well, thank you, Howard. It was really a pleasure being here. Uh, all right. See you soon.